talking about Osiris, uh, right? the Egyptian god of the, the afterlife, of the underworld, uh, who is also the deity of resurrection, regeneration, and immortality, with one myth telling how while the desert god Seth murdered him, he as a god of the soil and moisture returned to life again via the magical and life-giving powers of his wife and consort, Isis, only to find himself uh, in, in uh, the enthroned judge of, of the underworld. And so Osiris was the Egyptian form of the well-known dying and arising fertility god encountered throughout the ancient Near East. Uh, in this capacity, Osiris became connected to the cycles of the seasons as well as the rise and fall of the Nile River. He was also connected to the movement of the stars, uh, to the arising of Orion and Sirius. Seriously, uh, the, the falcon god Horus was the offspring of Osiris, uh, as well as Isis. And while uh, the pharaoh, he was, of course, Horus uh, when he was alive. Uh, in fact, he was anointed and possessed by the spirit of Horus, that made him, in a sense, the embodiment of this particular god. Uh, in his death, Pharaoh became associated with Osiris, uh, with the cult of Osiris, very much part of the Egyptian uh, cult of the dead. Uh, he was declared as both the Lord of Love and the Lord of Silence, very obscure. Uh, in fact, he, in a sense, is on the threshold mysterious realm of beyond. Now, now, Osiris, as I said, was the god of the underworld, uh, the afterlife, uh, the dead. And as I mentioned before, uh, Isis, his wife, was the goddess of the realm of life, of nature, of, of magic. Osiris really was essentially a god of, of, of the earth and vegetation uh, who died every year. Uh, during the annual drought. Meanwhile, Isis was the nature goddess who had the power, the magic, to help resurrect him so he could live and thrive again as represented by the inundation of the Nile. In fact, uh, Plutarch, an ancient writer, uh, writes, as they regard the Nile, as the effusion of Osiris, so they hold and believe the earth to be the body of Isis. Not all of it, but so much of it as the Nile covers, fertilizing it and uniting with it, unquote. Now, in short, Cyrus represents moisture. Uh, in fact, um, I will go ahead and continue to read Plutarch, who lived from the first century into the second century. Uh, he says as, as, as follows, not only the Nile, in or Osiris, but he says, but every form of moisture, they call simply the effusion of Osiris. Uh, I, I really like going into the primary sources. So often scholars, they, they go about and they try to identify why a idea or a belief or a figure or event is important. And the reality is I always like going back to the primary sources. Uh, what I like to do is go into uh, what they thought these various, uh, in this case, uh, God or a goddess represents and get their opinion on the matter because I don't know. I just kind of think we know better than we would. <laughs> what do you think? So I'll continue the quote by, by Plutarch. And he says, uh, and their holy rites, uh, in their holy rites, the water jar uh, in honor of the god heads the procession. So they would actually have uh, a procession. We'll talk more about the processions as dedicated to Osiris as we proceed along. Uh, but they would actually carry uh, in, in front of them uh, this water jar. And the water jar represents the water itself represents Osiris. Interesting, right? 
And uh, he continues by the picture of a rush, you know, the grass, right? The white lion that's all the way around the Nile here. Okay. Uh, by the picture of a rush, they represent a king and the southern region of the world. And the rush is interpreted to mean the watering and fructifying of all things. And in its nature, it seems to bear some resemblance to the generative member. Now, <laughs> generative member means the male phallic uh, uh, member. Uh, moreover, uh, when they celebrate the fist festival, excuse me, of the Palmelia, which uh, has been said to be of a phallic member, they expose and carry about a statue of which the male member is triple. So we're seeing here in, in, in Plutarch that there is a direct connection uh, between uh, Osiris in, in symbolism uh, and the male phallus member, uh, member so connected with that directly. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, according to Plutarch, he continues, uh, they expose and carry about a statue of which the male member is triple. So it's in a sense a triple phalli. phalli. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, and it says, he says, for the God is the source and every source by its fecundity uh, multiplies what proceeds from it. And is for many times we have a habit of saying thrice as for example, thrice happy. Well, back in the ancient times, when you want to emphasize something, uh, you would say something emphatically three times. That's what, you know, obviously today we don't go about saying, oh, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm thrice happy. <laughs> but, you know, uh, that's kind of got out of our meeting. Like uh, recently I was, you know, you know, the last couple of days, um, you didn't see me going thrice happy. Very, very, very happy, and maybe it did take the place of the berries. So you have the idea that um, uh, he's in, he's he's tripled because he is so great. In fact, um, uh, he continues. He says even thrice as many unnumbered, unless indeed. So he's talking about the fact that uh, Osiris uh, is is endless. He is the infinity when it comes to is powers of, of fertility, of, of creation, uh, of that special energy that is within moisture, within water, as talked about uh, by Plutarch and many other writers too. I'm just giving, just quoting Plutarch right now. Okay. And indeed, he says, of course, he continues on, by the nature of moisture being the source and origin of all things, created out of itself three primal material sources earth, air, and fire. This, uh, so he's now saying it all, it could mean three times as this is really emphasizing the fact that Osiris is, is, is powerful and infinite in power. That's the reason why you have the, the, the three phalli. Or it could also refer to, and obviously this would be a later revision on the part of Plutarch and many others during the, the Roman period, uh, it's the idea that uh, it represents the three elements that come out of water, uh, that being earth, air, and fire. Uh, for the Egyptians, uh, many Egyptians believe that the, the primary source is water, and life arises from the water, you know, from the primordial mound story, which we'll go over in a short bit. So, it is moisture uh, that uh, is Osiris. Isis becomes the magic uh, that takes this moisture, gives it energy, and gives it life. Well, already uh, during this talk, we have jumped right into the depths, so to speak, of the mystery surrounding Osiris, right? So with Plutarch's uh, words in mind, or Osiris as directly connected to moisture, was inclusive of male semen in relation to the male member. And so in the cult, Osiris and the phallus were often identified for that reason as well. As last I checked, 
that is moisture that gives light. And they had figured that out, right? Much like Shiva was with the Linga, for example. Egyptians viewed, as I said before, a water as the primary element, and Osiris was the water from which all the arise. So Plutarch uh, continues, and others have noted that the sacrifices to Osiris were gloomy, solemn, and mournful, and that the great mystery festival uh, celebrated in two phases uh, often began at Abydos, which commemorated the death of the god, and on the same day that the grain was planted in the ground, he says. The death of the grain and the death of the god were one and the same. The cereal was identified with the god who came from heaven. He was the bread of which man lives. The resurrection of the god symbolized the rebirth of the grain. So, so not only uh, is he connected to the element of, of water, uh, he is also connected uh, to the death and resurrection of the grain. So we'll go a little bit further into that. But there we have it. So Osiris, uh, he was connected to many other uh, rising, or I should say dying and rising gods. Um, and of course, uh, the, the Greeks connected Osiris to Dionysus. Uh, in fact, uh, Plutarch writes uh, to someone who is most uh, familiar with this idea, his friend Clea, who happened to be a priestess uh, of Delphi. Uh, and of course, he says that Osiris is identical with Dionysus. Uh, who could more fittingly know than yourself, Clea? Uh, for you are at the head of the inspired maidens of Delphi and have been consecrated by your father and mother in the holy rites of Osiris. And then, of course, he goes on and lists all the ways that they are in common. I mean, it goes on and on, but we, we'll just kind of skip over all of that. But we mentioned the fact that there are quite a few uh, connections. And, um, and, and the Greeks, uh, the Romans recognized that with these other gods. Uh, and now let's go into the actual word. The word, what does the word Osiris even mean? Unfortunately, it's controversial because there doesn't seem to be a set answer. So we have a few possibilities. Uh, now, obviously, uh, we, we look at the hieroglyphs and we realize that there's, you know, understood through consonants. We understand the consonants uh, because of the problem with the vowels. When we take a look at these words, um, it's hard to determine how it sounded at times. So what they ba, s, ya, er, right? You have as a basic root. Um, there's many ways that you can say this. Uh, you could say in ancient Egyptian, you could say aser. You could say yasser. You could say asir. You can say asuru, asor, asir, wisir, usir, usir, ausir. <laughs> so uh, there are quite a different ways of saying Osiris uh, in ancient Egyptian. Uh, and uh, the other problem is in some cases it could be inclusive of many of them based upon uh, the dialect in the area I and mean, the understanding of the word. Now we take a look at the root, uh, the what's er, uh, the, you know, and uh, it means the mighty one or can be the mighty one. So that's one possible interpretation is the word Osiris means mighty one. Uh, but if you look at the root another way, like the spit, right? It could actually mean the seat of the eye, <laughs> you know, or with yurt uh, could mean the product or, or something that is made, or uh, it could even mean uh, uh, wisit yurt could mean she who bears the eye, or yurt means to do or to make, make you get the point. So, what does it mean? Lost uh, in the, 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 the mist of the past. You know, we know. Uh, I went a little, little, little Osiris and what he looks like. Okay, so uh, Osiris is depicted in many different ways. So I'll go ahead and do a little, a little show and tell here. So 
Uh, Osiris is depicted different ways. There you go. Here we go. Here's Osiris. Oh, we take a look at Osiris here. Okay, so Osiris oftentimes will have a beard. Uh, this particular Osiris uh, does not have a beard, but uh, oftentimes has a beard. Uh, we take a look at him. And I'm just here. Maybe. Oh, somebody unplugged my light. Okay. All right. There we go. Well, you think this is a, this is an Osiris here. So you take a look at the, the conical hats right there. See the face there, and you see the arms are crossed. Of course, you see the hieroglyphics. Yes, this is real. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, came from the family, uh, and the provenance is before 1937. But this is a real Osiris, and it is. It's over 3,000 years old. Okay, so um, looking at this, take a look here. Um, uh, you, you see here that uh, uh, you have, there's a crown, uh, sometimes with two large ostrich feathers on either side. Uh, this, the crown is called a tiff crown, which combines the hijet, uh, which is uh, the crown of Upper Egypt, with a curly a red ostrich feathers on each side as well. And you can see here that there is uh, what's a crook, uh, which is a heka, and a flail, which is a nekhaka. Okay, so uh, the, the crook stands for kingship, and the flail stands for the fertility of the land. Now, of course, these words uh, you know, crook and, and flail are probably not used too often, so I'll explain. Uh, the crook and the, and the flail are were symbols of pharaonic power. Uh, it appeared first uh, in the context of o o Osiris. Crook uh, were it's a tool that was used by shepherds to kind of move those animals who are often very stubborn along, you know, just, you know. So it nudged them. It uh, guided them in the right direction. Meanwhile, a flail was an agricultural tool uh, that was used to, uh, to thresh grain uh, from their husks. So you kind of beat them uh, with a flail. Uh, so you have here the symbols of, of animal husbandry uh, and the symbols of, of course, agriculture uh, within the the canopy of this, this god of fertility. Are you seeing this? Connected to moisture. Uh, but also, if you take a look, uh, you realize that uh, uh, the crook was applied more gently and the flail more harshly. And so, in a sense, symbolically, uh, it kind of connects to the strength uh, and gentleness uh, of, of a pharaonic rule, uh, balancing each other out. Uh, you, you see that the image also is dark, right? And that means, you know, obviously it represents the, 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 the black mud, right? Dark mud of the Nile River, which is why Osiris is the black hole, right? Yeah, there you can see it a little better there. Okay, there's a long. Okay. Moving uh, right along. Okay. Okay, uh, both Osiris uh, and Isis were affiliated with various uh, Egyptian star cults, uh, which we don't have that much evidence for. We do have some, but uh, uh, so <laughs> welcome to the uh, really exploring in detail uh, aspects of Osiris, are we not, right? So Isis, along with the uh, goddess Sepet, was connected to uh, uh, Sirius, the dog star. Uh, the Egyptians uh, called Sirius Sothis, or Set. The star of Sothis was, was believed to be responsible for the inundation of the Nile. Uh, uh, of course, obviously making this association quite natural, and that Isis was connected to the revival of the waters of the most pivotal uh, 
uh, in Egypt, right? So basically, an Egyptian saw, saw her star. Uh, it, it was a relief because they knew that the waters of the Nile were about to rise. And, and of course, bring with it the very rich, uh, fertile mud uh, from upstream, of course. And that fertile mud, as well as the moisture in the mud, represents Osiris. You guys got that, right? So meanwhile, what about Osiris? He was believed uh, to be connected to the star Orion, followed by the Egyptians Sap, which was near to the star of Sothis. And of course, there's, you know, uh, we know that the pyramid texts, it's called the toe star, as in the toe, you know, your big toe, right? There was a controversy of, of which star it was for a long time. Some people said it was Alpha Orinius or Beta Orinius. But uh, the most recent uh, research says that the star representing Osiris was Rigel. <laughs> uh, Rigel was, of course, one of the brightest stars in the sky. Very obvious candidate, right? Uh, and, um, and one of the two feet of the anthropomorphic uh, figure of Orion, right? Uh, and so basically, uh, when you saw this star, which dances along with the star of Sothis, of Isis, then you know that this is, of course, Osiris joining in with, uh, with, his, with his wife. Uh, in fact, we see in the coffin texts from the Middle Kingdom, it shows that it indicates the order in which the stars appeared at night. Uh, it, uh, it says, I am the toe star who treads his two lands who navigate in front of the stars, the sky on the belly of my mother, Newt. So, uh, so basically, uh, uh, Sirius rises. Uh, well, actually, so Orion rises to the east. Brilliant Rigel leads the way and uh, seems to navigate things in the horizon. And then Sirius rises about 100 minutes later. And Sirius was identified with Isis, the wife and sister of Osiris. There was a natural pairing between these two bright lights and a practical application. Before having watched Rigel rise in the eastern horizon, the Egyptian priest astronomers would then have known where to look for the rising of Sirius, which, of course, connects to the, uh, the Egyptian New Year. This is pretty good. Interesting stuff, right? <laughs> so, uh, so seriously, as I said before, in a joking, joking sense, there. Um, yet, okay, without question, we're going to go back a little ways. Here we go, some origin story here. It is not Osiris, but Horus, who is the oldest god of Egypt. We got to know about Horus so we can understand where Osiris came about, right? Horus is the oldest documented god of Egypt, uh, patron deity of the city of Nekin, right in Upper Egypt. Uh, it's uh, we find uh, pre-dynastic artifacts uh, were, that were discovered at the city uh, connect to to uh, images of Horus, all right, and seems to appear around 3000 BCE. So Horus was was pretty prominent again in Upper Egypt. Now, Falcon God, Horus, was believed to be the god of the sky and was, again, as it worshipped during the pre-dynastic period uh, and was related. I was hearing it's important. Horus was related specifically to the power behind the king making him early on a, a national god. So, so his Horus is connected to the power of the king. In addition to empowering Pharaoh, Horus as, as a sky god was believed to encompass both the sun and the moon with the sun represented by his right eye and the moon represented by his left eye with both spheres moving because, well, he empowered them to do so. Empowered them uh, to have the power of flight. Of course, many wondered why his sun eye was brighter than the moon eye, so it was explained in the story known as the Contendings of Horus and Seth, that Seth 
the patron god of Lower Egypt, fought Horus, the patron god of Upper Egypt. The battle would later become between Osiris and Seth. So now already with Horus, you have a fight with Seth, the god of Lower Egypt, right? We know later on that it is Osiris that has a war with Seth, the god of Lower Egypt. So these themes are, are there at first within Horus. We'll be transferred over to Osiris soon enough. Of course, the battle was fierce. Uh, even though a, you know, Horus hurt his eye, uh, Seth lost the testicle. So, you know, I guess there's a there's a balance there, right? I'll talk a little bit about Seth because we're going to encounter him again. And um, he's another you know, very important. Now, Seth sometimes is called Seth Penn was the Egyptian god of the, the desert, the dry lands of the red soil and storms. That she became the, known as the deity of disorder and violence. Uh, but uh, first, he wasn't so bad. He was uh, believed to work for Ra, the solar barge, right? Uh, and uh, would join the sun god with uh, Ra when he went to the underworld for the night. Uh, Seth even helped fight Apophis, the serpent of chaos. Uh, so, uh, in fact, the interesting part is Seth wasn't chaos. He at first fought against chaos, but that starts to change. Uh, you, you, will, you will definitely have um, a conflict in Egypt where Upper Egypt will dominate Lower Egypt. And so the god of Upper Egypt, which is Horus, will defeat the god of Lower Egypt, which is Seth, and once upon, what, once that happens, then there's revisionism going on. And, and Seth, or Seth, is demoted, and he's made into something that is not good. Right? He's bad, right? Now, what's interesting here is Horus, let's go furthermore, was, uh, represented the black fertile lands about the Nile River. So according, uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned before, when the Nile River floods every year, it left behind a heavy silt of black soil that was very rich for the crops. Early on, Horus represented this rich black soil. And, but eventually, as you know, this rich black soil with the water within it, okay, uh, the moisture then connect to Osiris more than Horus. So uh, we see already early on when it came uh, to Horus, uh, which ideas that will go on to, to Osiris, the idea being connected to kingship, which of course Horus as well as Osiris would both hold later on. Uh, you have uh, the, of course, the uh, the connection as I as I just mentioned with um, uh, with, with the with the black with the black soil, right? You know, that. Uh, and of course, um, you have, of course, the other associations as well. Um, but I want to keep on going here. Um, we have um, moving right along. So, what happens? What, what exactly occurs uh, that uh, uh, you have another god that um, you know that connects? Oh, but I do want to mention one more story. Um, there's another story between, I knew I forgot something here, uh, between Horus of Upper Egypt and Seth of Lower Egypt. That's quite, that's, that's, that's pretty popular. Uh, it's in the Papyrus uh, Testabedi number uh, one. Uh, basically, uh, Seth uh, tries to prove his dominance over Horus by attempting to seduce him through his powers and to try to have uh, sexual relations with him. But when he's about to have his special moment, Horus quickly places his hands between his thighs and caught Seth's semen just in time, passing it into the Nile River. In return, Horus decided to dominate Seth through his own cunning nature and sprinkles his own semen on Seth's favorite food, lettuce. <laughs> and now after, uh, in a, you know, assuming his favorite lettuce that was offered by Horus, 
Seth, you know, had this lettuce. <clears throat> and what happens is that both appear before the gods. And they're able to decide who is stronger than the other. Okay, so what happens is that Seth claimed that he had the power uh, over Horus. He declares that he's dominant and called forth his semen, believing, uh, you know, that, that would be, uh, you know, connected to Horus. But instead, the Nile River uh, declared for him. Meanwhile, of course, Seth had eaten the lettuce. Uh, and uh, when Horus called the same, uh, his power came out of the mouth uh, of Seth. No, wait, what? Hey, yeah, really awful story, but for you both. The worst. Why are you telling this? Uh, because this is connected to the idea of the power of the semen, which will eventually go over to Osiris, which we just talked about, right? So this is the other connection I wanted to bring about uh, is that Horus uh, is connected to the, the, the mud of the Nile, uh, but he's also connected to the semen of the Nile. And these ideas will eventually be transferred over uh, to Osiris, as well as the connection, obviously, the kingship, which is shared by Horus and uh, Osiris alike. Now, and then you're thinking, so we're done with the connections. Oh, uh, one more, of course. Uh, another god by the name of, interesting, it's, it's K N E T I. So it's Kniti. And the last part is uh, Amen Tu. A-M-E-N-T-I-U. This is another god that's important. He was the chief of the Westerners, or the foremost of the Westerners, the realm of the West, which was associated with the realm of the dead. Right? So Kniti, uh, Amentu, uh, is a jackal-headed deity. Uh, his image is found all over Abydos. There's even a temple dedicated to him there. Now, Kaniti Amatu even uh, replaced a previous god by the name of Wet Wawet, not kidding you, W E P W A W E T, who is the opener of the roads or ways, who is connected to both the underworld, leading one through the dark pathways, and to the decisions of both kings and commoners. Uh, yeah, so what will happen is he's also was connected to, and then later on, uh, Kenet Amatu, connected to the opening of the mouth ceremony. So this particular god will also directly then connect to uh, what will become Osiris. So we're looking at the roots of, of, of Osiris, and it appears that part of it comes from Horus, right? Uh, with, of course, obviously, uh, the ideas of connected to the semen, the moisture, and then the kingship and so forth. And, of course, uh, now you're having this god merging uh, with aspects of Horus that will become independently Osiris. You have the idea of the underworld and the opening of the mouth ceremony. So, we are ready for Osiris to finally appear. We, we kind of know how it happened, right? So by the time we get to the first dynasty, uh, both the pharaohs Den and Kua began a tradition of giving their predecessors the title Horus, right? Kenti Amatu, right? So it's Horus, Kentu Amatu, right? So of course, we talked about Amatu, right? But so these are the names of their predecessors, starting with Narm, which is the possibly the first dynasty. So this is the beginning, right? Now, watch this. Now watch how gradually Osiris will appear. Horus was, at this point, solely connected to Pharaoh. But this would change. As Osiris eventually emerged with the deity, Kemeti Amatu, and started to gain in popularity. In fact, by the time of the pyramid texts, uh, 24,000 to 23,000 BCE, during the Old Kingdom, Osiris, uh, his name appears for the first time. It was already closely connected to Kenneti Amatu, who is the god of the underworld. We find in the pyramid text of the Old Kingdom direct evidence of when Osiris did become more revered. 
uh, for in the entombed formula uh, of the Pharaoh. Uh, it began at, actually first with, you would say, this is what you would do uh, for, the, for, the, for the formula for the entombed Pharaoh. Okay? An offering the king gives and Anubis. This is during the, the fourth dynasty, which is 2613 to 24. Uh, sorry, uh, 2419, uh, 20, uh, 26, But what happens is there's a change. The change occurred uh, during the fifth dynasty. And instead of saying an offering uh, the king gives and Anubis, it says an offering the king gives and Osiris by the end of the time of the fifth dynasty. So you're going to see a change now. Os Osiris is there. Eventually, Pharaoh becomes viewed as, there you can see it, both Horus and Osiris, the god of the underworld. Remember, we just talked about the fact that Horus is identified with Pharaoh. Pharaoh literally will be viewed as possessed by the spirit of Horus. And so Horus speaks through Pharaoh. This makes Pharaoh a god. So no wonder you better obey Pharaoh, because if you don't, you are disobeying God. And of course, that's blasphemy, right? But what will happen is, is that by this time, you know, you're going to have now Osiris starting to be connected to the, the Pharaoh. So what will happen is Pharaoh acts as Horus in life and Osiris in death. Okay, well, now you're seeing it. Once Pharaoh died, Horus was believed to incarnate as the very next Pharaoh. Now that Horus and Osiris were connected to one another through Pharaoh, uh, the question centered upon how they were related. How do they, how, how are they related? Well, in this capacity, uh, there's a change. Eventually, Horus became viewed as the son of Osiris and the goddess Isis. So that was how they became associated. In the capacity of a, of a child, Horus would eventually be depicted naked and sitting on a lotus with his finger in his mouth. Uh, almost, uh, he's on the lap of, of Isis, suckling, almost looks like the Madonna and child, a little bit, right? So, uh, and of course, his name uh, means falcon. Right, as you mentioned. So this is now the connection. So now Osiris uh, is the father of Horus. And so Pharaoh is Horus in life. And when he dies, he becomes Osiris, the underworld. You, you, get, you get to see connections. So slowly but surely, right? Um, now during the, uh, the fifth dynasty, uh, the you're going to see some also uh, interesting bits and pieces here. Uh, Osiris uh, is going to be um, called upon in order to ensure the afterlife. In fact, uh, uh, some people will pray to Osiris to ensure that they uh, receive uh, sustenance and other benefits in the afterlife. There are other gods that are called upon, but Osiris more and more becomes the one that you, you, you call on in order to have a happy afterlife. So more and more, the underworld connection is emphasized. Also by the fifth dynasty, Osiris uh, became uh, understood as a merciful judge of the underworld. Right as of all things, follow this, the Lord of love. They called him the one who was, quote, permanently benign and youthful, unquote. So he's not this, this, this horrendous, evil underworld deity. He's a, a, a kind one, a loving one, right? Osiris was, was there to help the Pharaoh in the afterlife. And uh, while well, according to the pyramid text, the goddess Isis was there to help his wife or wives. So you have Horus, sorry, uh, Osiris helping Pharaoh in the afterlife, and um, you're going to have Isis helping his wives, right? 
He was also, as I said, associated with, a, with meditation already during this time uh, and fertility, right? Now, the pharaoh Eunice, uh, mid-24th century BCE, uh, he was the last uh, ruler of the 5th dynasty. Uh, and uh, uh, he was connected, he, he even connected the cult of, of Osiris even more to Pharaoh as time goes on. Once again, we see the evidence in the, in the pyramid texts, um, and uh, which will, of course, go make, make this uh, intimate connection between Osiris uh, and, and, uh, and, and Pharaoh, right? Now, what will happen is you're going to start seeing here and other places spells to ensure various things in the afterlife. What is important is that uh, they'll do the spell and they will say it to Osiris and then they will become Osiris so they can go into the underworld. Now, of course, this may make many people pause. So wait, does the Pharaoh, does he become really a god? Uh, not necessarily. What happens is that uh, this is just a, uh, a ritual text of identification. Uh, and so you're supposed to identify yourself as that deity in order to, in a sense, ride along with that deity into the underworld. So you're not really the deity, but you're speaking as the deity, as the deity, in a sense, envelops you and holds you and carries you to the other side. Does that make sense? So you're not it, but you're speaking as a god. This starts to develop uh, during uh, this period of time. Uh, and of course, uh, whoever worships Osiris and recites the various spells connected to him will live with him forever. So you're having this, this sense of, of salvation. Yet yeah, really, it's only reserved for Pharaoh and the, the few of his court. Right, and Pharaoh himself uh, it really alone uh, is connected to the Osiris element or aspect. So, but uh, I still think it's uh, it's it's fascinating where you get into this concept of identifying with a, a god and its aspect and becoming that god and aspect in a ritual sense, but not an actual sense, but speaking as or possessed as. Uh, it carries you uh, to the other side. So we're kind of going into the, the science involved, or like the science involved of going into the uh, how these ideas or mechanisms uh, work. Um, but of course, obviously, uh, it's it's not perfect. Uh, what will happen also uh, is that um, bring it up. Uh, you do have uh, uh, other things as as well that is involved, that is, as Osiris gets, um, he gets helpers, here it starts. So Osiris, pyramid texts reveal one of his helpers, uh, and uh, one of these helpers uh, is known as, uh, it's, it's actually Shezmu, <laughs> Shezmu, it's the servant of Osiris, uh, who is also, of course, connected to the underworld, uh, kind of residing in this it's the space between light and dark. Uh, he was the, uh, Shezmu was the god of oil and perfume and um, red wine. Uh, yeah, well, in fact, what happens is that Shezmu uh, punished evildoers. How he typically would do this is he placed their, their heads into a, a supernatural wine press and squeezed them until all their blood was drained out of their bodies. Really nice guy, right? Because of this uh, really macabre duty, Shesmu was often known by the epithet demon of the wine press. You know, um, it, it could have like a red wine called Shesmu wine. What do you think? Yet for the righteous, uh, Shesmu offered refreshing red wine upon their soul's arrival uh, to quench their, their thirst. Shesmu is oftentimes depicted with the head of a falcon, but sometimes he's just shown as a, as a man. But he is he is in the servant now of Osiris. Um, now, a little other things that 
Chesmo, uh, make sure that um, everybody is properly fed with uh, spiritual God food. Right? Yes. So the Pharaoh uh, would be began his journey, and uh, in some cases, the Pharaoh would consume the gods <laughs> to give him energy, ritualistically consume the gods to give him energy to cross the other side. And Shesmu, uh, the servant of Osiris, about. Uh, sometimes, uh, we have one text uh, where uh, Pharaoh rises to the heavenly realm via a celestial uh, ladder. And he says, Hail, daughter of Anubis, above the hatches of heaven, comrade of Toth, above the ladder's rails, open Eunice's path, let Eunice pass. And of course, uh, uh, he would pass, and uh, you had Osiris sometimes would, or the aspect of Osiris would lead him along, right, uh, to the other side, once again, because they had this personification thing. Now let's go a little bit deeper. You thought we, we would not go so deep? Here we go. So let's go into the idea of the soul, because it's everything to do with understanding Osiris. Okay. According to the Egyptians, <laughs> we have, uh, our soul has five parts. Five parts. You have the Ren, the Shut, the Ib, the Ba, and the Ka. So the Ren, the Ren, R-E-N, as we would say it, is that part of the soul which is uh, connected uh, to the, the person's name, right? So upon birth, the person receives a name given to the person. And so the name is connected to your soul. Your name is connected to your soul, even after death. So you, you got to you gotta sometimes protect your name because if somebody who has your name and it's not properly defended, not protected, they can, in a sense, start to snatch your soul. So this is, of course, you got to have a magical rope, especially when you write down your name. So, um, so you have the name written down, and there's a magical rope that's put around it in order to protect that name from any danger. And, of course, uh, that rope is known as a cartouche. Ah, yes, when you see uh, the various names of Pharaoh, you see that little circle thing around it? That's a cartouche. So you can't take the name of Pharaoh or anybody whose name would be within the cartouche, and use it in order to access their soul. So that is known, again, as a red, right? Now, the shoot, S-H-E-U-T, it means the shadow. This is viewed as connected to the person uh, soul as well. So, yeah, your shadow. Some people, your shadow is, you know, your, your soul emanated out of you. Here we go. The ib. The ib was the metaphysical heart associated with a person's emotion and thought and intent and will, right? This is found its way into the Egyptian language so that uh, if one was feeling, to say, happy, uh, they were experiencing atib, which means well, it's based wideness of heart, right? But if they were hurt or upset, they had kiptib, which means the truncated heart. Right? This metaphysical heart was believed to continue on and was in some way connected to the space occupied by the real physical heart, or at least symbolized by it. So that while all the organs were removed to embalm the body, the actual heart was to remain. Right? The heart was to be examined by Anubis. And the other gods, then weighed by Mott, the god of truth, against a feather. If the heart was light as a feather, it would pass on to the realm of bliss. But if a person was heavy hearted, they were cast into darkness to be swallowed by a mitt, which means the soul eater or devourer. It was often depicted as a crocodile, part hippopotamus, and part lion. Okay, so Amit. Now, where did this judgment happen? It happened in front of who? King Osiris, who is the judge of the living and dead. 
and he would make that decision accordingly. So he would decide whether, in a sense, you deserve to live or not, right? So once again, Osiris is very much a part going into the soul. The most important part of the soul was the Ba and the Ka. The Ba is the individual's personality, that which makes one unique. Uh, and, and so that's important. Finally, uh, the Ka is your vital essence. It's the part that actually gives you life. It, it gives you life. So, so that means, uh, so in a sense, you know, why we live. So when you die, you know, your, 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 your ka, which gives you life, leaves you, right? And then, that, of course, you, you die, right? Now, uh, the god Hulum was believed to create each person's soul on a potter's wheel. And when it's done, he breathes into it the breath of life. That is the ka, and it lives. Uh, Kanum was actually the god of the source of the Nile River and tied to life-giving silk and clay. And you can see the connections here with Osiris as well. When you die, Ka leaves the body, but through the opening of the mouth ceremony, which is now connected with Osiris, the Ba is released and permitted to join the Ka in the afterlife, creating what is together known as the Ak, which means the effect of one. So the, the Ba and the Ka combine together, right? The Ba, the Ak could still visit this life and do good or bad to those still living. Uh, could even appear as a ghost, right? But the ox also still dwells within the physical body when it's preserved, right? So, so there you have it. So, but Osiris, uh, in, in in turn, is connected uh, to this uh, to these aspects of the soul. In fact, um, ultimately, as I said before, the body talk uh, would merge with Osiris, the lord of the underworld in aspect. Again, we have Pharaoh Eunice, and we have a source here. It says the pyramid text declares, O Eunice, you have not gone dead. You have not gone alive to sit on the throne of Osiris. Your scepter is in your hand that you may give orders to the living, the handle of your lotus-shaped scepter in your hand. Give orders to those of the mysterious sites. And so you see that in, in a rather curious development. Uh, this is where it gets really strange. The Ba of Osiris became worship. You're thinking, what? Wait, wait, the Ba? You mean the personality separate from the rest of Osiris became worshiped? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so there, there became those who just worshipped the aspect of Osiris uh, that was his personality, right? Uh, to the point, uh, so it, it became a separate god. So the Ba of Osiris was, was called the Ba Nebda Jedet, which means the Ba of the Lord of the Jet. And, um, and it was, he was worshipped. The Dejet was viewed as the backbone of Osiris, uh, and uh, the Dejet was also viewed as representing the Nile River, which is, of course, the backbone of Egypt. So you can see Osiris is declared as Lord of the Sky, and uh, but he was also, at this point, connected directly. Here we go. The Nile River. Hey, here we go. See, so we're seeing these, these the evolution of these ideas as they slowly uh, come about, uh, the cult of the of this worship was centered at Mendes, located in the Nile Delta. Here, an actual living ram was kept and viewed as sacred, and even worshipped as the incarnation of the Ba of Osiris. When the ram died, it was properly mummified and buried in the necropolis, where the earlier rams were buried. Uh, and so, there you have it. But uh, now when we get to the time of Mentu Hotep II, uh, 2061 to 2010, the pharaohs believed that through sympathetic magic, again, they could become Osiris themselves after death. This idea now starts to uh, further evolve. And so via this god of the underworld, 
uh, you could have the power to rise again to a new life following uh, your death. We find evidence of this belief within the mortuary temple uh, of Mentuhotep, where the pharaoh is now indeed directly related to the Theban god Osiris, uh, who during the 11th century enters a place of importance within more general religious Egyptian beliefs. By the new kingdom, this resurrection connection to Osiris was believed to be available uh, to all Egyptians. And then we're going to see, of course, uh, the creation myth that arises uh, from Heliopolis. According to this creation myth, it, it goes as follows. Um, uh, it comes from Heli a tomb rises as, uh, as a mount upon the primordial waters and generates Shu, the god of the air, and Tefnut, the goddess of water. Next, Shu and Tefnut copulate and produce the earth god, Gib, and the sky god, Nut. Gib and Nut then have four children. Well, the first, of course, was Osiris, god of regeneration. The second child was Isis, goddess of life, magic, and rebirth. The third child was Set, god of chaos. And the fourth child was Nuthi, symbolizing the process of dying, but also of, of protection. And so this idea uh, starts to, to come about. Uh, now, the sky goddess Nut was typically depicted as nude and often appears with her body covering the sky with legs and feet on the ground. Sometimes Shu, the god of the air, holds her up in the middle. Gib, of course, as the earth reclines beneath her. Nut uh, has her headdress as a pot that most people believe represents a uterus. Uh, at times, uh, rather than a human, uh, Nut is shown as a guise of the cow covering the heavens. Now, according to the myth of Ra and Nut, the sun god was fearful that Nut would have children because then he would have possible rivals to his throne. So he decreed Nut shall not give birth any day of the year. At this time, the year had 360 days. And so Nut was bound to that set number of days. But she had a plan with Toth, the god of wisdom, who worked around Ra's edict. Toth noticed that Kansu, the god of the moon, liked to gamble. He also know that he was very good at it. So Toth set up a game whereby Kansu lost. And he had to give up some of his light uh, that he used to illuminate the moon. Kansu kept on losing to Toth. So eventually, Toth had enough light in his possession to create five more additional days. And so now we have 365 days taken advantage of this adjustment. Nut produced five more children uh, during those five days, uh, giving birth uh, to Osiris, Horus, Set, Isis, and Nephthys. Ra found out he had been tricked. He was so angry, he forced Nut to stay away from Gib for all eternity. Uh, and of course, uh, we have uh, the, the Shu, the god of air, that keeps them apart. According to now Egyptian mythology, Osiris used her ladder. Nut's ladder to enter the skies and so eventually escape from the realm of, of the earth. Osiris declared, O oh, my mother Nut, stretch yourself over me that I may be placed among the imperishable stars which are in you and that I may not die. Because Nut was believed to have saved Osiris and through him offer uh, she, through him, then offered possible salvation for those who believed in him. So she also became connected uh, to uh, the realm of the afterlife. In fact, her, her letter is ladder, excuse me, is depicted, depicted on various uh, tombs. Uh, accordingly, the righteous souls of those who die would be drawn into her heavenly realm, where she uh, relieved their hunger and thirst and food and wine. Uh, I am Nut, and I have come that I may enfold and protect you from all things evil. So you're having uh, this idea come about. Now, during the 12th dynasty of the Middle Kingdom, under Pharaoh Sensurat, 
uh, we see in a stele uh, named after the Egyptian treasurer, a description in relation to a passion play in connection to Osiris. So this is the Middle Kingdom. And now we go into the festivities in connection to Osiris. Now, there is a ritual ceremony. Uh, it is described uh, and it is performed on the occasion of the last month of the annual flooding of the Nile, which for the Egyptians was their version of the spring. The site, as I mentioned earlier, was Abydos, the traditional location where the body of Osiris landed after drifting down the Nile. The ceremony appears to follow the famous fertility myth of Osiris, uh, but in an earlier form. For example, in this early Middle Kingdom version, there is no cutting the body of Osiris into 14 separate pieces. It's not mentioned on the stila. Yet we know the story of Seth in re relation to Osiris did exist at this time. We find this in another document. As for the ceremony itself, uh, it basically goes as follows. It goes, it's five days long. The first day is the procession of Whip While Wet, remember that name? A mock battle was enacted during which the enemies of Osiris are defeated. A procession was led by the god Whip While Wet, or opener of the ways. On the second day, the great procession of Osiris came about. Here, the body of Osiris was taken from his temple to his tomb. Uh, the boat was transported. Uh, he was transported in this boat and uh, had to be defended against his enemies. On the third day, Osiris is mourned and the enemies of the land are destroyed. Uh, on the fourth day, there's a night vigil of prayers made and funeral rites performed. And on the fifth day, Osiris is reborn. Uh, and uh, at dawn, and crowned with the uh, with the crown of Mat, and a statue of Osiris uh, is then brought uh, into uh, the temple. And so, uh, I, I do have the edict here. Uh, I would just say just a few things here to be noted. Uh, he says, "I acted as son whom he loves for Osiris, first of the Westerners. I adorned the great forever and ever." I made him a portable shrine, the bearer of beauty of the first of the Westerners of gold, silver, lazuli, fragrant woods, carob wood, and meru wood. I fashioned the god's belongings to his divine Aeneid, made their shrines anew. I caused the lay priests to know how to do their duties, caused them to know the stipulation of every day, the feasts, the beginning of the seasons. I superintended the work on the sacred bark. I fashioned his chapel, chapel, and he goes on and on, all the wonderful things that, that he performed. As for other rituals uh, performed to Osiris during this festival, uh, Plutarch states the priests bringing forth a sacred chest containing a small golden coffer into which they pour some potable water, and a great shout arises from the company for joy that Osiris is found or resurrected. We know it again, there's a connection of water. Then, accordingly, they need some fertile soil with water and fashion therefrom a crescent-shaped figure, which they clothe and they adore, this indicating that they regarded these gods as the substance of earth and water. Yet this account is still pretty obscure because he says, I pass over the cutting of the wood because he didn't want to describe it. But the annual festival involved also the construction of what are known as Osiris beds. Osiris beds formed in the shape of Osiris and filled with soil and sown with seeds. Um, we also have in the Osiris temple in a place known as Bendera, an inscription that uh, goes as, as follows. It, um, well, actually, I'll just say, it, des it describes in detail uh, the making of meat paste models of each dismembered piece of Osiris to be sent out to the town where each piece is discovered by Isis, 
obviously this will involve the the later uh, belief that uh, of the death of Osiris and then being cut into many pieces by by Seth, right? At the temple of Mendes, uh, a figure of Osiris was made from wheat and paste and placed in a trough on the day of the murder, and water was added for uh, added for several days until finally the mixture was kneaded into a mold of Osiris and taken to the temple to be buried. Sacred grain for these cakes were were grown only in the temple field, by the way. Molds were made from the wood of a red tree in the form of the 16 dismembered parts of Osiris. The cakes of divine bread were made from each mold, placed in a silver chest and set near the head of the god with the inward parts of Osiris uh, described uh, in the Book of the Dead. You also have uh, what's called the festival of the plowing, but uh, a lot of this is more connected uh, to Isis, where she appears in her shrine, stripped naked, paste made from the grain, were placed in her bed and moistened with water, representing the, the earth. All these rituals, of course, uh, ended with the eating of the sacramental god, a Eucharist in the sense, uh, and replicas of this god-man were consumed. Uh, and the idea was, of course, bringing about or connecting with this uh, sense of fertility. All right, well, we're covering quite a few materials. Okay, now we move in to the New Kingdom. Uh, this, by the New Kingdom, the resurrection uh, connected to Osiris was believed to be available to all Egyptians. So the resurrection aspect now starts to expand. Isis enables Osiris to resurrect for the seasons to be renewed and so really becomes the resurrection deity uh, with the Egyptians believing that through sympathetic magic via Isis that they may be uh, resurrected uh, too. The Egyptians had, uh, did put their trust uh, in Osiris himself and addressed their prayers directly to him uh, as, be, as a being. Uh, now what will happen is that um, uh, you're going to see that uh, uh, he, Osiris, he raised himself from the dead without seeing corruption. And so he had bestowed upon his own earthly body by means of his divine nature, the gift of everlasting life, uh, which of course it enjoyed in an incorruptible and glorified form in heaven. So you're seeing this uh, Osiris as his intermediary between us uh, and the afterlife. And now it's going to be all of humanity, as opposed to just Pharaoh and his court and those who uh, know uh, select knowledge of the, this means by which we can pass or make us pass to the other side. Uh, during the reign of Thutmose the third, uh, this Pharaoh was made to say upon his tomb, Homage to thee, O my divine father, Osiris. You have your being with your members. You did not decay. You did not turn into worms. You did not rot away. You did not become corruption. You did not putrefy. I shall not decay. I shall not rot. I shall not putrefy. I shall have my being. I shall live. I shall germinate. It shall neither fall into ruin nor be destroyed off this earth. So you can see. Again, there's a sense of identification. Uh, it's not direct, but it is, uh, there's a sympathy or connection between the two. Now, the Egyptian Book of the Dead became very popular at the beginning of a new uh, kingdom. Uh, so the coffin texts, and it says later on, get written down uh, and becomes more popular for everybody else, right? And so here, when you die, you awake, you do your homework, you read your included manual of the afterlife. And of course, again, we have the story where you go through, uh, you have to memorize various spells and you go through the various levels. Uh, and then you uh, finally enter the court where Osiris is and you have the weighing of the heart ceremony uh, before Mott, the goddess of truth. Uh, and of course, Anubis, the jackal headed god, uh, and um, your, your heart is weighed you go to one place or the other. Uh, Amun Hotep I uh, 
thought, you know, now that we have the Book of the Dead, we really need to go a little bit further. We pharaohs, we want to have something special to us. The Book of the Dead is no longer special to us. So they had their own special work known as the Omduit. And that, that work means that which is the underworld. Uh, and uh, what we'll see is that the, the, the surviving text that we have is actually from Tutmos the, the third. And basically what happens uh, is that you go through the underworld and the 12 hours of night. So this will be important a little bit later on. But I will mention the fact that uh, uh, so you go and you recite and you follow the, the realm of, of the night uh, and uh, where law uh, descends into the western horizon. And then, of course, the second hour, you go into the watery realm. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, the continues into the third, the fourth. Uh, you go into this really this treacherous zigzag pathway back and forth. But by the, the fifth hour, the sun reaches the tomb of Osiris, which is covered by a giant pyramid-shaped mound. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, um, uh, declared as Isis covering Osiris. And over the summit of the pyramid, Isis and Nephthys fly about uh, as two birds, Egyptian kites, birds of prey, right? And underneath the tomb uh, resides the lake of fire. And so what happens, here it is, is during the sixth hour, the soul of Ra that began to go through the hours of the night, right? Uh, what will happen is it's called in this text, the Ba is united with his body. So, so basically in the middle of the night, so here we go, I'll just catch you go a little bit earlier. So the Anduit, you follow the sun, and the sun descends into the horizon. And as the sun descends into the horizon, it goes into the underworld and goes through the 12 hours of the night. You follow the sun, right? As you go through those hours, when you get to the, the middle hours, right? The fifth and sixth, you're at the, the darkest level of the night. And that's where the sun reaches Osiris in this great pyramid that is also connected to Isis. It is believed that that sun then, can, the, the, the sun, Ra, uh, God, the sun, can, his Ba connects with the Ba of Osiris and regenerates it. And then, of course, the sun will return uh, to, the, to, the, to the realm of the light in the next subsequent hours and rise to the other side. So that means that every time the sun goes into the underworld, it regenerates Osiris, uh, the god of the underworld. So there is a nice uh, connection between those two. Um, okay, Amon Hotep, uh, the first, of course, was the first sparrow to be buried uh, at uh, the Valley of the Kings. But we also know that uh, there was a cult that surrounded him as Pharaoh. Uh, and uh, what's interesting just about that is that uh, Osiris was uh, connected uh, to that particular uh, cult uh, in various liturgies. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, and again, uh, you would have, he was a, Osiris was appealed to whenever you made offerings to this deified uh, Pharaoh because he is, in a sense, Osiris incarnate, or sort of incarnate. Now, what will happen is, is that uh, something strange occurs. And we're here, we're, we're treading on, again, areas that most people have, do, do not talk or go into. That is, uh, Osiris will start to have more and more connections with Ra. Gradually, but you can see that happening, right? You can see that. I mean, already you're having uh, Ra going down uh, and regenerating Osiris in the underworld. You see that this is going to be, in a sense, bound to happen. So, slowly but surely, what will happen is um, two are identified with one another, and then you have a Kananata. 
Akhenaten uh, is the great monotheistic pharaoh, you know, and uh, what happens is that uh, he creates a solar religion uh, and uh, related uh, related to this god by the name of Aten. So worshiping not the disk of the sun, which Aten is, but worshiping that which is beyond that symbol. So you do have this monotheistic uh, like notion going on there. And so, so, so what he did is destroyed all these other gods and goddesses and declaring this one god. But what is fascinating to me is that he didn't destroy all the images of Osiris. And people go, are wondering, well, why didn't why didn't he destroy all the images? Then it's fascinating because we look at uh, kind of not the iconography, and he kind of uh, times he looks like Osiris. He he bears a you know resemblances to to this image, and you're going, well, oh, that's that's strange. Some scholars have said, well, the reason why is a Kananatan is taking on the aspect of Osiris himself, so he is Osiris, and uh, who is uh, who is then connected to the great god of the sun, the great god beyond. Uh, so many scholars, again, uh, are looking into this, but I think it's a fascinating thing, uh, this, this relationship. Well, and also the idea that he's connected to this the solar cult. As time goes on, all right, um, you're going to have even uh, inscriptions talking about Ra Osiris. Well, uh, you're going to have, then what happens is, is well, Tutankhamen. The Tutankhamen, uh, he comes about, and what he does uh, is that uh, he restores monotheism into Egypt. Uh, he, he brings it back, and, uh, and that means that he brings back Ra. Uh, he brings back uh, also uh, Osiris and the others. Uh, what, what's fascinating is many scholars believe uh, that uh, he actually tried to make himself look like Osiris. That uh, he covered his his, his uh, body in black oils and resin, uh, so that his skin would become black like that of Osiris, and may have been connected to the accidental fire that some people say that burned his body and cracked these bones that we find. Although some people say that maybe he fell by the bone cracked. But he also had a raised phallus, which, uh, when he's mummified, again, connected to Osiris. Uh, furthermore, uh, he was without, without a heart. Some people say that, well, maybe it's because he, you know, he had heart problems. Other people will relate and say, well, no, no, it's, it's because uh, Osiris was known not to have a heart. So, uh, that's a possibility. Well, what's going to happen now is a, a gradual decline of, of, of Osiris as time goes on. We have what is known as the Book of Caverns. Uh, this is during the 20th Dynasty, 1189 to 1077 BCE. Basically, it describes the journey of the sun god Ra through six caverns of the underworld. Uh, and focuses upon his interactions with the inhabitants of the underworld and the sun god, including, of course, you know, meting out uh, punishments for the wicked, uh, rewards uh, for the righteous, right? Uh, Book of Caverns uh, also uh, is the best source on the Egyptian perspective of the underworld or hell in general. We take a look at these, these caverns. And we do have those who are the justified deceased, who are now viewed as divine creatures. Uh, but there is a cavern reserved uh, for the Osiris's corpse. And the sun god as well, uh, his own two divine bodies. And um, so, wait, what's going on here? Okay, 
So what's going to happen uh, is that the is that you're going to have now again the idea that uh, that Ra and Osiris will come together uh, and they uh, and and, Os and Osiris will be empowered. But in this case, here we go. In this case, remember before in the Andalus that that you had the sun going down into the underworld to the various 12 hours of the day, and the fifth and sixth goes down to the place where there is o Osiris and, of course, the pyramid. And, and I talked about the fact that there was this empowering aspect. The sun would empower uh, uh, Osiris right there in the underworld, regenerate him. And then, of course, the sun would simply rise up again. Well, in the Book of Tabernacles, you have this idea, but beyond just the regeneration of Osiris, the Book of Caverns then takes an aspect of Osiris with the sun god as it rises to the other side and enters into the next day. Are you following me? So, so, but the Book of Caverns does not have Osiris as superior to the sun. Uh, he's still a writer, uh, writing along uh, the, the, the bark of the sun moving to the other side. But now, when it comes to rituals, are you getting this? Now, Osiris, in a sense, uh, if you connect with Osiris, right, you do go to the other side completely uh, in, this, in its metaphysical way. You do, you rise to the other side. Osiris uh, is regenerated but not just regenerated in his place in the underworld, but is brought uh, to the overworld, so to speak. Okay, uh, so exciting stuff. Well, I know we're running out of time, but I think we, we really did cover a lot of what I really wanted to go over, so that, that's good. Uh, as time goes on, we enter into the Hellenistic period. And Ptolemy the first was the king of Egypt, and he created the cult of Serapis, wanting to unify the Greeks and the Egyptians in its realm. And so what he does is that uh, a Serapis is basically a combination uh, between the Egyptian uh, god Osiris and Apis, uh, as well as with Greek Hades. So uh, that's basically, and of course you can have Isis. Uh, um, as as the as the consort, and and obviously uh, we can move on from there. And I'm going to go ahead and summarize a few things. Do see that we're almost done here. Yeah. I have to be slow because I don't. I have antiquities over here. I don't want to knock anything. And then finally, we get to the epic story. Which we will not talk about because we talked about it in my ISIS talk, so we won't go too much too 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 far into that. I would just mention the fact that there is uh, the famous Osiris and ISIS story. Uh, that basically you have uh, in a nutshell. How can I say this real fast? Is once upon a time you didn't have Osiris. Osiris is now, uh, according to Plutarch and many others. Uh, he is a human-like king or a deity-like king. He he, and he's going to. Uh, he decides to go against cannibalism. You know, humanity's not doing very well. They're eating each other. You know, so he's going to teach them agriculture. He goes off and he becomes, in a sense, the prophet of agriculture, teaching people all these kinds of how to plant and everything else. Meanwhile, Isis, his wife, is left behind, and ooh, here comes Seth. And Seth is interested in Isis. And so there's something going on there, but Isis is not giving out too much. Well, uh, Osiris returns, Seth has an idea, he, he puts together this chest and says, hey, uh, whoever fits in this chest oh, uh, gets, gets to keep it. Apparently it's a really beautiful chest. So he made this exact size of Osiris. So Osiris lays in it and immediately uh, Seth uh, and his agents cover it. They nail up the lid, 
and then they they, they throw it uh, uh, into the Nile, uh, and it floats away and ends up at Biblos in Lebanon. Uh, Isis is upset. Uh, she goes in search of this of this chest, but what happens is that this chest uh, gets caught, goes on the, on the shore, and a tree grows up around it. And the king of Biblos takes that takes that tree uh, and and carves it and makes it into a pillar of the palace. Okay, so Isis now arrives, can't find uh, uh, my beloved anywhere. And, uh, and so what she does is she starts to weep and she uh, starts braiding the hair of the queen's daughters uh, and decides, and the queen decides to make her uh, the, the wet nurse. <laughs> so, so now she's part of the family. Meanwhile, she's trying to sense where in a well, where, where in a world, world is my husband? And she's meanwhile she's also nursing uh, the queen's uh, uh, son, but uh, through using her finger and burning him in, in, in at evenings uh, so that he will become immortal. But then of course the queen walked in. Oh, okay, <laughs> and then, uh, and Isis is fully revealed. And then Isis says, hey, you know, us hubby is in that pillar. And so uh, the pillar uh, is revealed. Osiris is brought back. And then, of course, ah, okay, here comes Set, not to be defeated. Uh, cuts Osiris in, in, you know, 14, sometimes 16 pieces. It depends on the version of the story. And the long and the short of it is, uh, is that uh, uh, she's running around looking for pieces. She can't find it all. I mean, she found most of it, except one piece is missing, his phallus. So what she does is she makes a magical phallus out of his body, and she becomes impregnated. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, uh, this will become Horus. Uh, she becomes impregnated with Horus. And then, of course, he becomes the god of the underworld. And I can't believe I told that story in that past. <laughs> so one of the pieces of his body was at a place known as Philae. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Upper Egypt, and that became one of the main areas for the burial sites of Osiris. It was revered uh, for a very long period of time, going even uh, into uh, late antiquity. Uh, people would go there uh, and would surround uh, his burial site with pails of milk. Uh, they would do various water rituals there. Uh, and it looks like that, that slowly but surely uh, Isis became more prominent and Osiris by name became less prominent as early as the third century. Uh, but aspects of him was still worshipped, but he started to slowly disappear uh, into oblivion. Uh, and in fact, many scholars would say that uh, him by name is lost in uh, by the time we get to the uh, late 300s uh, and the 400s. Uh, but uh, Isis will, of course, continue on in many different forms. But Osiris, here we go, the idea of a dying, resurrecting deity, those ideas will be very much matched within the growing religion known as Christianity. All right, we covered it. Uh, <laughs> quite a bit. What I, what I enjoyed is going over some of the details that normally get overlooked. And I wanted to make sure that we talked about those because you don't hear that so much in Osiris. Anyway, thank you so much. Any questions? Oh, you're welcome. Hmm. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing in the chat. So we covered everything? All the knowledge of the world in, in an hour and a half. <laughs> Yeah. Well, is Osiris still worship today in Egypt? No, that's why I said he, you know, the worship of, of Osiris just 
it, it really uh, it really by name started to disappear uh, during the three into the four hundreds. Fascinating. Uh, what happened is Serapis that continued for a longer period of time, and so uh, I, I should have brought up the fact that the Osiris aspect uh, within Serapis uh, had more longevity, but not so much in Egypt, but more in Asia Minor, which is, uh, of course, obviously Turkey today. And so, so as so, so I, Osiris as Serapis has longevity, but Osiris himself kind of loses his importance as we get into late antiquity. Uh, but Isis continues. So uh, you, you do have, you know, they would relate to him as simply a husband or the consort or, you know, or Isis was enacting upon directly the, the Nile itself. And then, of course, uh, her, her identity will start slowly fade away too. It is, it is an interesting story um, um, how he, he just fades away, but it's probably not to be unexpected because of the, well, the rising star of Christianity, uh, who, who also has identity, you know, because remember, think about it. Uh, I hope you ca caught this, the idea of identifying with the deity without becoming the deity in order to gain salvation. In Christianity, you become Christ-like, right? You identify with Christ in order to uh, receive salvation. And you are carried over, right, through Christ uh, to the, the realm of, of paradise, so to speak. Well, he already, uh, by the time you get to the the book of caverns you already are seeing this idea right but even earlier too that osiris is 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 bringing you over he is the 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 dying and rising deity so so a lot of these ideas uh are being exercised elsewhere within christianity there you go All right. Well, okay. Yes, okay. that's it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting.